Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the next part of our, like, the, some additional work for our English lesson. Um, what we've done in the past is, sorry, guys, I've tried to make sure that we have time as a class to go up to the library to find something that, a book that we enjoy and to do our own personal reading. Um, unfortunately, we can't really do that today. So, I thought that we might have something similar going on, um, where I would read the book and you guys would sort of just take it in. It's a bit of a relaxing thing in having a book read to us, but it's also looking at you guys, um, one second. Hello. I'm trying to work out the correct volume. All right. So it's part of it is also you guys doing a little bit of written work at the end of it. So, what we're going to be doing with this book, if you guys will bear with me, because I just realized I should probably give you something to look at while we're doing this. I'm gonna move that to that screen, bring that here, open that. Open that. Okay. So, <laughs> if I, so the book we're looking at, and if you guys could just write it in, in the work, work that you're using is called Just Doomed. In case that's a bit small, I'm going to hit the layout. The same thing I always do. I like my small margins, my landscape orientation. I'm going to make it Times New Roman. We're going to make our size 22. Boom. So. The way the things that I want you guys to take away from this book are who are our characters? Where does the chapter take place? And what happens in this chapter? So this is the setup that we're going to have in our book. You guys might want to write one and two, but leave a couple of lines between each one because you might need a bit of extra space. Again, if you run out of space or if it's super messy and you're stressing out, don't stress. Who has the messiest writing in the class? A hundred percent. It's me. So this is our setup. I am going to try and bring myself back on the screen. Boom. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the book we're reading, Just Doomed. It's by, it's on the top, Andy Griffiths. And the illustrations are by Tim Denton. We're going to have a look at what illustrations are important to the story. And we're going to be showing that I'm going to try and show you guys, but it's a bit hard. I'm going to try and get close. I might have to close my blinds, which no, that doesn't help at all. So I'm going to open up to get a little bit of light in the room. If you get stuck, if you forget, don't stress. You can go back and watch the video again. If you get it a little bit wrong, that's not the end of the world. We're not going to stress too much about all of these things. Okay. So we're starting off our book. Just Doomed, Terry Denton. Chapter one. Andy's handbag. I'm going to be trying to do voices for the characters, but I can't promise that I'm going to stick with the voices all the way through. I'm going to try and bring this across so that when I'm checking the recording to make sure it's good, I'm at least looking at the camera. Guess how I'm spending the first day of my Christmas holidays at the circus. No way. Too exciting. At the zoo. No way. Too interesting. At the beach. No way. Way too much fun. Give up. I'm at the post office. In a queue. With my mother. No chance of anything too exciting, too interesting, or too much fun happening here. I guess that officially makes these holidays 
the most boring holidays anybody has ever had since the history of holidays. I mean, if you can think of a more boring holiday activity than waiting in the queue at the post office with your mother, I'd sure like to know what it is. And to make it even worse, it's a really slow moving queue. Oh, it wouldn't be so bad if the post office just sold stamps and envelopes like post offices are supposed to. But they're, but they're selling about a billion other things like books, DVDs, money boxes, footballs, mobile phones, printers, diaries, and foot massages. It's more like a $2 shop than a post office. Except that most of their stuff costs a lot more than $2. Plus, you get served a lot faster in $2 shops. The only good thing is that since we joined the queue, there are three more, pe three more people have lined up behind us. We haven't moved, but at least we're not last anymore. Be quiet, Andy, whispers mum. I am being quiet, I say. You're not, she says. You're doing that weird narrating thing again, like you're telling a story to somebody. I'm just trying to amuse myself, I say. I mean, believe it or not, waiting in a post office queue is not exactly my idea of a great time. It's not mine either, says mum, but I've got a parcel to collect and I need you to help me carry it home. Oh boy, I say, this day just gets better and better. Amazingly, incredibly, against all odds, the queue moves forward and now we're one step closer to the counter. What's in the parcel anyway, I say. I have no idea, says mum, so it is a bit exciting. I roll my eyes at her to indicate just how unexciting I think it is. On the stand next to us is a book called Criminal Masterminds of the 20th Century. Now that's what I call exciting. I pick it up and flip through it. Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Pablo Escobar, The Joker, The Penguin, The Squizzy, oh sorry, and Squizzy Teaspoon Taylor, just to name a few. It's very cool. Can I have this book? I say. No, says mum. But you're always telling me that I should read more. Not about criminal masterminds, she says, reaching for a large colourful book. How about the magic fairy pony? That's a lovely story. I used to love it when I was a little girl. In case you haven't noticed, mum, I say, I'm a boy. Boys don't want to read about magic fairy ponies. We want to read about criminal masterminds. Please, mum, please, 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 please. Oh, all right then, sighs mum. Apart from your complaining, you have been quite helpful today. But don't blame me if you read that book and end up behind bars. Don't worry, mum, I say. I'm too clever to get caught, I promise. Now it's mum's turn to roll her eyes at me. Then she frowns. What's the matter? I ask her. Uh, uh, my handbag, she says, looking all around her. Where's my handbag? The purple one? I say as if there could be any other. Mum's handbag is pretty hard to miss. It's bright purple with a big sparkly buckle. Yes, says Mum. I definitely brought it with me. Let me see. I had it at the chemist and then at the dry cleaners. Oh, how silly. I must have left it on the counter. Can you run back and get it for me, Andy? Me? I say alarmed. You want me to get your handbag? Yes, says mum. I'll wait here. But it's a handbag, I remind her. Yes, and a very nice one, says mum. I'd hate to lose it. Hurry up. But I'm a boy, I say. So you keep reminding me, says mum. But carrying your handbag will be embarrassing, I say. What if someone sees me? They'll just think, there goes a boy with a very nice handbag, says mum. That's exactly what I'm worried about, I say. Can't I wait here while you go back? No, says mum. I need to sign for the parcel and there's no way I'm leaving my place in this queue and starting again. But the queue's not moving anyway, I say. At that very moment, the queue moves forward. Andy, says mum looking serious. I'm not asking anymore. 
I'm telling. Go and get my handbag or else. Or else what? I say. It's important to look at all your options before you commit to a course of action. Especially one as potentially embarrassing as carrying your mother's purple handbag down the street. Or else, says mum. All right, all right, I say, heading for the door. I'm halfway down the street before I realise I'm still holding the book. Oh no, I didn't pay for it. Mum's right, I will end up behind bars if I'm not careful. Yeah, I know, accidentally taking a book without paying for it isn't exactly the crime of the century, but I guess all criminal masterminds have to start somewhere. As I walk into the dry cleaners, the lady behind the counter recognises me and holds up Mum's handbag. Ah, she says, is this your handbag? Well, yes, but it's not my handbag, I say, it's my mum's. You should be more careful, she says. There's been a lot of handbags stolen lately. You're very lucky I saw it in time. Very, very lucky, I say. But like I told you, it's not my handbag. It's my mum's. She's the one who should be more careful. She hands it to me very solemnly. Don't lose your handbag again, she says. Thanks, I say. Oh, I won't. I could try to make her understand that it's not my handbag, but at the rate it's at the rate it might take me. Sorry, at this rate it might take me the rest of the morning. I'd rather just get it done, get it back to its proper owner, and pretend none of this ever happened. I carry the bag out of the dry cleaners and walk as fast as I can back towards the post office. I'm on the main street now. Everybody's looking at me. This is embarrassing. The only thing that could make it any worse is if I see someone I actually know. And then I do. Out of the front of the supermarket, the very last person in the world I'd want to see me with a handbag, Lisa Mackney. She's facing away from me. But if she turns around, I'll be caught red-handed with a purple handbag with a big sparkly buckle. Uh-oh, she's turning around. I quickly drop the bag onto a bench seat next to me. Lisa sees me and waves. I wave back and she starts walking towards me. Okay, I tell myself, just be cool. Be cool. There's nothing wrong. You're just standing here on the street. There's a handbag on the seat next to you, but there's nothing. To, but it has nothing to do with you. You're the same normal non-handbag holding tough guy you've always been. Hi, Andy, says Lisa. How are your holidays going? Great, I say. Action packed. What about you? Okay, I guess, she says. I've just been hanging around helping mum, you know. <laughs> Sounds terrible, I say. Not really, she says. I like helping my mum. She works so hard and it's good to be able to help out in the holidays. Yeah, yeah, of course, I say. I was just joking. I've been helping my mum a lot too. I flick a nervous glance at the handbag. So far, so good. Lisa hasn't noticed it. Once she's gone, I'll, I'll be able to pick it up and get it back to mum. And this whole unpleasant business will be over. But Lisa is in no hurry to leave. What are you reading? She says. I realise I'm clutching my stolen book to my chest like a shield. Oh, this, I say. Just a book about criminal masterminds. Are you planning on becoming one? Says Lisa. Yeah, I say. Either that or a vet. Possibly both. Lisa laughs. Well, good luck with that, she says. I guess I'll be seeing you around. Yeah, I guess so, I say. Unless you'd like to hang out sometime this afternoon if you're not too busy. I can't believe it. Oh, Lisa was saying that. <laughs> Unless you'd like to hang out sometime this afternoon if you're not too busy. I can't believe it. Lisa is practically asking me out on a date. Not so practically, she is asking me out on a date. She must be attracted to the criminal mastermind aura this temporarily stolen book is giving given me. I don't think I've had any major crimes planned this afternoon. I say, so yes, that would be great. Okay, she says. How about the park by the lake after lunch? How about two o'clock? Sounds perfect, I say. See you then, says Lisa, smiling. Well, this has gone about as well as it possibly could have. 
Thank goodness mum forgot her handbag. And thank goodness I insisted on getting it for her. Lisa turns to le leave, then stops. She looks at the bag. She looks at the bench and then at the bag on the bench. Uh oh. Look, she says. Somebody's left their handbag on the seat. I can't tell her the truth. I just can't. Better just to pretend I know nothing about it. Yeah, I say, looks like it. What should we do? Says Lisa. I shrug, just trying to act casual despite my pounding heart. Just leave it there, I say. The owner will come back looking for it sooner or later. But somebody could steal it before then, said Lisa. Who would steal a crazy looking purple handbag like that? I think it's nice, says Lisa. I mean, I'm not saying I would steal it, but there are plenty of dishonest people around who would. Perhaps we should open it, look inside and see who it belongs to. Maybe there'll be a phone number we can call. No, I say quickly, maybe a little too quickly. Why not? Says Lisa, looking puzzled. Well, um, it could be dangerous, I say. Like we open the handbag and the owner might return and think we're stealing stuff from it. Lisa nods thoughtfully. Good point, she says. Maybe we should just take it to the police station and let them deal with it. That would probably be the most responsible thing to do. But what if the owner returns and thinks somebody's stolen it, I say. Well, it probably really will be stolen if we just leave it here, says Lisa. And besides, sorry, Lisa's voice is really hurting my throat. I'm going to have to stop. And besides, they would just go to the police station to report it. And there it will be waiting for them. I can't argue with her logic. Well, not without telling her the truth. That it's kind of weird to hand your own mother's handbag in at the police station. A reporter's lost when you know full well that it's your own mother's handbag. But I can't tell her that. It's just too embarrassing. And her plan does have certain advantages. I mean, for a start, that I won't have to carry mother's handbag anymore. I can just tell mum it wasn't at the dry cleaners. It must have been stolen. And then suggest we go to the police station and there it will be. Perfect. Yeah, you're probably right, I say. Take, um, taking it to the police station is a good idea. Okay, says Lisa, picking it up. Let's go. Oh, no. She wants me to come with her. That's definitely not a good idea. Oh, I say, striking my head as if I suddenly, as if suddenly remembering something. I can't. I promised my mum I'd meet her at the, at the post office. I have to help her carry a parcel. Andy, says Lisa, I think this is more important. And it won't be, it won't take long. I know, I say, but you don't know my mum. She gets really mad and I did promise. Can't you do it? I can, she says, but we did both find it. I'd feel, I'd feel better if you were there. I take a deep breath. How can I possibly say no to Lisa? Okay, I say, I'll walk you there, but then I really have to go. Thanks, Andy, says Lisa. I knew I could count on you. As we walk to the po police station, we pass the post office. Through the window, I can see mum still waiting in the queue. She's not far from the front now. I turn my head away so she doesn't see me. The police station is two blocks further up the road. As we reach the entrance, I stop. There's a wanted poster in the window. That looks a lot like you, Andy, says Lisa. It's not me, I say. I know that, laughs Lisa. I was just joking. Uh, yeah, right, good one, I say, adding my best fake laugh. Reckon you're, you'll be right to take it from here? I'd rather you came with me, she says, says Lisa, looking slightly daunted. But I can't go in. The police will recognize me later when I come back with mum and collect the handbag. Well, I would, I would, I say, but the police stations are not really my scene, you know, with me being, starting to be a criminal mastermind and all that. Lisa laughs nervously. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so, she says. Well, thanks for coming this far anyway. See you this afternoon. She heads up the stairs towards the doors. I turn to run back to the post office. And when I'm startled by the policeman and policewoman coming up the stairs towards me, 
The policewoman is tall. The policeman is tall, sorry. He towers over me, studying me intently. Uh, everything all right? He says. Y y yes, I stammer. I'm f fine, sir, uh, officer. Officer Collins, he says, pointing to his badge. And this is my colleague, Officer Murphy. Are you all right? Sorry, are you sure you're all right, she says. You seem a little um, agitated. I don't know why the police officer's British, but she is now. <laughs> I suddenly realise I'm still clutching my, the book about criminal masterminds to my chest. My stolen book about criminal masterminds. Well, temporarily stolen anyway. With the title facing outwards. Stupid, stupid, stupid. A real criminal mastermind wouldn't make a stupid mistake like that. I'm so overcome with guilt, I can't speak. Luckily, Lisa turns around and saves me. We just came to hand in this handbag, she says. We found it on the bench, down the street. Officer Murphy smiles at Lisa. Well done. Oh, Murphy's the girl. Well done, she says. I've lost the voice now. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Come inside and we'll take we'll take care of it. Officer Collins, however, is not smiling. He just continues studying me, studying me suspiciously, while Officer Murphy and Lisa enter the station. I reach deep inside for my voice. Well, a whisper. I guess I'll be going then. What's your hurry? Says Officer Collins looking at me through narrowed eyes. I have to help my mum with the parcel, I say. Aren't you going to wait for your girlfriend? She's not my girlfriend, I say. We're going to need your name and address. But why? I, d I, d I didn't do anything. Nobody said you did, he says, studying me even closer. But the owner of the bag might want to leave a reward for you. I'm pretty certain that's not going to happen, but of course, I can't tell him that. Uh, I'm, I'm okay, I say. I'm sure Lisa will give me half. Oh, I thought you said she wasn't your girlfriend. She's not, I say. Then how do you know she'll give you half? How do you know she'll give you any? Money makes people do strange things, you know? Boy, could I tell you some stories? It's okay. I say, really it is. I don't even mind if Lisa doesn't give me any money. She, she was the one that found it. I thought you said you both found it. He says, well, it, it was more her than me, really, I say. In fact, I hardly found it at all. He studies me in silence for a while longer, for a while longer. There's something funny going on here, he says. I can smell it. There's something you're not telling me, and I intend to find out what it is. There have been a lot of handbag snatchings in the last few weeks, and I think you might know more than you're letting on. No, honestly, you're making a mistake. I know nothing. That may be the case, he says, but all I know is that is you and this girl, who may or may not be your girlfriend, are in possession of a handbag which may or may not be stolen. And that you're reading a book about criminal masterminds, which, for all I, for all I know, may be stolen as well. And you're acting very suspiciously. Suspiciously indeed. I think you'd better accompany me inside so I can get to the bottom of this. But there's nothing to get to the bottom of, I insist. I'm innocent. I'll get to the bottom of that says Officer Collins. Great, just my luck to come face to face with one of the greatest crime fighting masterminds of the 21st century. As he leads me inside, I pass Lisa coming back out. Andy, she says. I shrug and try to act unconcerned and cool as it's possible for somebody holding a stolen book while being questioned about police pretends to be. I'm just helping prof out Officer Collins with some inquiries, I say. See you this afternoon. I can't hear her reply as I'm swallowed up into the building. Officer Collins leads me to a seat opposite the counter. Stay there, he says. I'll be right with you. I nod. He goes behind the counter and disappears down a corridor. He's probably going to the interview room, 
to put a, to put a new globe in the bright light. They're going to shine in my eyes until I break down and confess. I look around me. There are a few more wanted posters on the walls behind the imposing wooden counter. And on top of the wooden counter is my mother's handbag. Officer Murphy is off to the side of the counter in a little glass thin office, still, still filling out paperwork. She's not paying me any attention at all. This is my chance. I can make it out of this whole difficult, embarrassing, uncomfortable situation, disappear in an instant. All I have to do is grab the bag and run out of the police station and meet mum at the post office where the bag will be restored to its rightful owner and the book can be paid for. No crimes will have been committed and no messy, embarrassing truth will ever be revealed. As reluctant as I am to compound my crimes, it's a no-brainer. I jump up, snatch the bag from the counter and make a break for it. I burst through the glass doors and out into the bright sunlight and run down the street as fast as I can. Well, as fast as I can, clutching a large book in one hand and a bright purple handbag in the other. I can hear shouting behind me, but I'm already too far away to be able to make out what they're saying. I hear sirens. That's not good. A gunshot. That's definitely not good. Collins and Murphy clearly take a, uh, take a dim view of the handbag snatching, especially when the handbag snatching takes place in their very own police station. But it doesn't matter because I'm almost at the post office. Just a little further and I can slip inside and lose myself in the queue. They'll never find me there. And even if they do, mum will tell them it's her handbag and will pay for the book and there'll be no more problems. Except, before I can, before that can happen, there's one small problem. One very small problem. Well, one big problem, actually. Lisa is standing outside the post office. And not only and not only does she see me carrying the handbag that she, the one that, sorry. And not only does she, now she see me carrying a handbag. The one thing above all that I wanted to avoid, but she's standing between me and the doorway to my future as a respectable law-abiding member of society. Andy, she says as I run towards her. What are you doing? I know this looks bad, I say, glancing over my shoulder at the police who are running down the road behind me, guns drawn. But I'll, I'll explain this afternoon. Uh, no, you won't, she says, sticking her leg out in front of me. You'll explain right now. I'm going too fast to dodge her leg. I go flying through the air and end up sprawled face down on the footpath. I'm still clutching my book in one hand and the handbag in the other. And for a moment, I figure I can get up and keep running. But before I can do that, Lisa takes matters into her own hands and sits on me. I'm sorry, Andy, but it's for your own good. Well done, Lisa, says Officer Murphy. That's the worst British accent I've ever tried to do. <laughs> well, well done, Lisa, says Officer Murphy. As she arrives on the scene, we'll take it from me, says Officer Collins, grabbing my arms and snapping a pair of handcuffs on my wrist. I knew there was something fishy about you. You're the bag snatcher we've been looking for. I'm not a bag snatcher, I say. Really, I'm not. But you just snatched that handbag says the officer. Yes, I did snatch that handbag. I admit that. But it's my mother's handbag. You snatched your own... Oh, Lisa. You snatched your own mother's handbag, says Lisa, looking even more shocked than she already had a moment ago. What kind of monster are you, Andy? That's exactly what we're going to find out, says Officer Collins, helping me to my feet. I won't be surprised if that book is stolen as well. I stand up and realize that a large crowd has gathered. And part of that large crowd includes mum. She's peering out behind the brown paper parcel she's holding. Uh, uh, Auntie, what's going on? Do you know this boy, says Officer Murphy. Yes, says mum, though at times like this, I wish I hadn't. He's my son. What's he done? He stole a handbag, says Officer Collins, holding it up for mum to see. That's my handbag, she says, and he didn't steal it. I left it at the dry cleaners and I asked him to go and pick it up for me. That may be the case, says Officer, Col says Officer Murphy, but he stole it from the police station. You stole it from a police station, says Mum. Well, yes, but I wasn't really stealing, I say, because... 
before I can make them appreciate the finer points of the situation, the post officer manager bursts through the crowd. Officers! She yells. Arrest that boy! <laughs> we already have, says Officer Collins. What else has he done? She picks up my criminal masterminds of the 20th century from the footpath. He took this book without paying for it, she says, holding it high in the air for everyone to see. Just as I expected, says Officer Collins. Oh, and Andy? Says Lisa softly, shaking her head. What are you going to do with your life? I thought you were only joking when you said you wanted to be a criminal mastermind. But now I see that you really mean it. No, you, you, you don't understand. No, you don't understand, says Officer Collins. You're on a very slippery slope, young man. A very slippery slope indeed. It starts out with reading books about criminals and stealing books about criminals and then stealing your own mother's handbag, then stealing strangers' handbags. And pretty soon you're driving stolen cars, robbing banks and running an international crime ring. Before you know it, you've earned your own chapter in Criminal Masterminds of the 20th Century. You mean 21st Century, says Mum helpfully. Officer Collins shrugs. For all I know, madam... Your son is so bad that he could already be he could already be well on his way to earning a chapter in criminal masterminds of the millennium. But something tells me we might have caught him just in time. I think we can nip this in the bud by waiving the charges and enrolling him in our early crime prevention program. That should scare some sense into him. Oh thank you, says Mum, almost crying with relief. Thank you so much. I think it would do him the world of good. Sorry, just checking how long this recording is going for. 31 minutes. We're fairly close to the news chapter. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Officer Collins uh, turns to me. You're a very lucky boy, he says. We have a new program starting at 2 o'clock this afternoon and running every day for the rest of the holidays. If you'd like to accompany Officer Murphy and myself back to the station, we can fill out the necessary forms and get you settled in. We'll have you back on the straight and narrow in no time. What do you say? What can I say? The prospect of spending the rest of my Christmas holidays in an early crime prevention program isn't exactly appealing. It doesn't sound nearly as exciting as the circus, as interesting as the zoo, as much fun as the beach, or as romantic as on a date in the park with Lisa. But I don't think they're going to take no for an answer. And hey, who knows? It might not even be so bad. Maybe you'll get to, maybe I'll get to meet some real life criminal masterminds. And in the breaks, when they're not telling me scary stories about life in the big house, they'll probably be able to give me some tips on how to get a, how to get my criminal career as a criminal mastermind up and running without getting caught. Yeah. Move over Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Pablo Escobar, the Joker, the Penguin, Squizzy, the Teaspoon Taylor. There's a new guy in town. Andy Handbag Griffiths. It's definitely got a ring to it. You don't, you think? All right, guys. So that was our first chapter. It did go a bit longer than we expected. Um, going in with this chapter. So this is like additional stuff. So if you finish your work early. So remember, we are, is it still on this page? Yes, it is. How do I do that? Boom, boom. So who are the characters? Where, where does the chapter take place and what happens in that chapter? No, where's my camera? I'm going to move this here. I have lost the camera. Nope, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So those three questions in your workbook, if you need, um, yeah, if you need help with any of it, let uh, me or Ms. McCallum know. Anything you need, we're here to help you guys out. So in any case, thank you all for watching. See you next time.